In the last video of this series, we looked at computed properties and how we can create computed values based on other properties and even manipulate and change them when another one is updated via the setter. In this video, we want to find out how we can modify properties of a struct or a class using a function or method, and we will find out what the difference is between a function and a method. We'll revisit the concept of encapsulation so that our functions or methods are created in the best locations for our purposes while finding out what a mutating method is. We'll also explore how we can restrict access to properties from outside of the class or struct. And finally, we'll see how we can create a static type property that acts as a global property for all instances of the type. If this is something you're interested in, well, keep watching. So let's take a look at what I used to do before I knew any better. In this playground, I'll create a simple score class that has a single stored property that is an integer that represents the user's current score, and when it's initialized, I assign a default value of zero. To increment that score, I create a function that will accept a value, an integer value, and increment that value by another certain value, with the default being one. I didn't really do this, but the example will serve the purpose that I'm trying to get across. So let's create an instance of score and then use that function to increment our current property. We see that the initial value of current is zero. So let's pass that value into our function and increment it with the default value and check. It's one as expected. Let's do it once more using a value of five to increment. And as we hoped, the value of current in the MyScore instance of score is now 6. Methods are just functions that are associated with a particular struct or class. Instead of calling a function by its name, we can place that function with modifications inside the struct or class, and then use the struct or class instance, followed by a period, then the function name. This tells me that the function belongs to the class or struct. To distinguish between the two, the convention is to call it a method instead of a function. Let's duplicate that score class and call it score1 and bring that increment function in-house. Since the current score is already part of the class, we don't need to have it as part of our function method signature. In the method code block, we just have to make sure that any variables we are using are either part of the method signature, like val, or one of the stored properties, like current. With that method now an instant property of our class, we can access it using dot notation. I'll create a new instance of score one, and it has a default value of zero for the current score. And we can now use the instance method to increment it either using the default value to get one, or choosing to increment it by a value of five to get the final result of six. Let's duplicate the class once more and change the name to score2, but this time let's change the class to a struct. You'll immediately see the error, left side of mutating operator isn't mutable. Self is immutable. Struct properties are inherently immutable. Classes are reference types, but structs are value types. The properties of value types cannot be modified within its instance methods by default. In order to modify the properties of a value type, you have to use the mutating keyword in the instance method. With this keyword, your method can have the ability to mutate the values of the properties and write it back to the original structure when the method implementation ends. So by adding the word mutating in front of our method, the error goes away. We can test this out by creating a new instance of the struct. And then we can call the two instance increment methods as we did in the last example to change the current value. The final result of six is what we expect. This is good. But notice that I can also set the value of current directly. This is not so good. If you watched the previous video in this series on computed properties, we talked about encapsulation. It basically means that information and states of a class should be hidden from outside of the class, and only the class itself or struct should be able to manipulate it. 
As a consequence, both bugs and logical errors are much more unlikely. So let's duplicate that struct again and call it score 3. I'm going to make this property private so that it cannot be modified from outside of the struct. Let's see if that works by creating a new instance of this struct. I can call the same increment functions as I did in the last two examples because our method is within the struct and has access to all of the properties of the struct's instance. But when I try to find what the current value is, I hit a roadblock. I see that I don't even get code completion. This solves our problem that we identified in the last example because if you can't access the property, you can't change it. If I try to access the property by name, I get this error. Current is inaccessible due to private protection level. What we want is for the current variable to be internally accessible or gettable, and by that I mean from anywhere in your module, but restrict the ability to set it from within the struct. We use the private set modifier to indicate that the properties getter still has the default access level of internal, but the property is settable only from within the code that is part of the score 3 struct. The error goes away and our value of 6 is displayed without error. Now if we wanted to use this struct inside a framework or other module, we would have to add public to this too, which is perfectly legitimate, but it's not needed here because the default serves us just fine. The final thing we want to talk about is adding a static property. A static property is basically a global property that all instances of the same type share. They are sometimes called type properties. Properties like current in our score struct has its own value for every instance. That's why it's called an instance property. If we have a multiplayer game going on, then we can have multiple instances of our score struct or class with each instance having its own current score. What if we want to keep track of the highest score for all instances? Every time an instance score exceeds the past high score, we want to update that high score so that all instances are aware of it. The way we do this is by creating the variable using the static keyword. Let's duplicate score 3 and call it score 4, and we'll add a new static integer variable called highest score and initialize it at 0. Now remember, our current variable can only be changed by way of the increment function as it is an internal get, but a private set. So within our increment function, we can check to see if the new current value is greater than our global static variable. Since highest score is a static property, we need to access it using the type name, in our case, score4, and then use the dot notation to access it. So if current is greater than score4.highest score, we can set it to our current value. Let's test that out. We can create two instances of score 4 as score 1 and score 2. I'll set the initial value for score 1 using the increment function and set it to 10. Let's check the highest score. Remember, since it's a type property, we need to use the type name to access it. As expected, the highest score is now 10. Let's increment our score 2 by 6 to make it 6, as its initial value is 0, and the highest score is still 10. Good. Let's increment score 2 again by another 6, making it 12. When we check the highest score now, we can see that it is 12, as expected. Everything is working. Or, as the developers used to say where I worked, everything is WAD, working as designed. Well that completes this tutorial. I'll wind up this series in the next video by looking at property observers. I'll leave links to the other videos in this series in the notes below. Just one final note. The only reason why this method is marked as mutating is because it's a struct. If it were a class, we can remove the mutating and we'll achieve the same results. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please give it a thumbs up below and subscribe to my channel. If I get enough positive feedback, I'll continue to build out similar tutorials for Swift developers who have left the starting gate but still need to add to their toolbox. You can check out my YouTube channel to see what other videos I've created. Visit my website to see my iOS app portfolio of apps currently on the App Store. 
and check out my GitHub repository to see what else I'm up to. Thanks for watching. I'm most active on Twitter, so follow me there for notifications of other Swift-related things that I'm up to.